we turn to the evolving discussion about abolishing police in the prison industrial complex amidst the disproportionate rates of police killings and incarceration of black people. A new study published Thursday in the medical journal The Lancet estimates the federal database, known as the National Vital Statistics System, failed to count more than half the deaths from police violence over nearly 40 years. Researchers from the University of Washington also found black people were killed by police at a rate three and a half times higher than white people. This comes after a series of police killings of African Americans last year prompted um, a, reckon, a racial reckoning, including George Floyd in Minneapolis, Breonna Taylor in Louisville. Many states have since passed laws aimed at reforming police, but efforts to pass a federal law to overhaul policing failed to pass the Senate, and bipartisan talks over police reform broke down last month. For more, we're joined by Derricka Purnell human rights lawyer, columnist for The Guardian, author of the new book, published Tuesday, Becoming Abolitionists, Police Protests and the Pursuit of Freedom. Derricka, welcome back to Democracy Now! You are Hi. a— thank you. It's great to have you with us. Congratulations on this book. You're a you. black woman, a black mother of two black sons. <clears throat> you were a advocate for police reform, but you are now what you would call a police or prison abolitionist. Explain your journey. Of course. So, like lots of people who grew up in the United States, I had just unexamined commitments to using and relying on police in my neighborhoods, in my community because they were the institution that was the most well-resourced, right? So I had a ton of ranges of experience with police. And even throughout those horrible encounters, I, it, they were often the only option to respond to harm and to respond to violence. And so the book details that sort of early experiences. And then what happened once I became part of social movements, who pushed me to think more critically and more beautifully and more creatively about building a world without violence, right, with how to, to reduce our reliance on police and to reduce the reasons why people need them. The book also kind of describes a political journey of a generation, which I believe I'm a part of, who went from fighting for George Zimmerman's arrest and imprisonment in the wake of killing and murdering, rather, Trayvon Martin back in 2012 to become a generation who's, who is leading, I would say, the call to abolish the entire cross of the state. And so it, it documents that, that political journey of a generation, as well as my personal political journey of becoming an abolitionist. And, and Derek, you, you talk in your book about how your experiences in South Africa contributed to your becoming an abolitionist. Could you explain how and, and why? Yes, of course. So in 2000, I think 15, 2016, the student movement that was called, it still is called, Fees Must Fall and Roads Must Fall, they were pushing and fighting for a 0% increase in their tuition. And just to see the amount of repression that they received from the South African government, from the South African university presidents, I mean, sending in black armed private police to attack them, brutalizing them because they were demanding free education, an uh, end to colonization of the university and the, and the entire country, really. T to see them fight for the end of contractual labor so that their parents and janitorial workers and dining service workers could get benefits from the university. To watch them be met with so much repression from black police, it, it was Honestly, just it clicked like, oh, yeah, diversity is not a salvific force. It's, it's not enough to hire more black cops, more women cops, more queer cops. That's ultimately not the problem with policing. Police are sent in to ultimately manage inequality and to stop people who are fighting for progressive change. And uh, how do you respond to those uh, uh, political leaders, uh, white as well as uh, uh, African American, who say that the abolitionist movement is not realistic, that the majority of people in the black and brown community still uh, want policing to protect them? Well, I would say that I have lots of things to say to those people, especially the black ones who are dismissive of abolition as an outside agitator call to action, which is completely not true. The tradition of people fighting for police and prison abolition is rooted in black feminists like Miriam Cobb, Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Rachel Herzen. So I would just, one, just try to clarify what, what we mean when we say abolition. The second thing that I would say is that, well, 
they're very excited to point to those statistics about black people who would like to continue to use police in their neighborhoods. But when we look at black people who are also demanding, you know, more resources for education, more jobs in a community, universal health care, those political leaders are usually not interested in using statistical support for black communities for those progressive causes. And so what happens is that there's a devaluing and a divestment in all the other resources that black and brown people, working class people demand in their neighborhoods. And then they hurl, they, they hold up one specific statistic that they're willing to pay for in order to call it public safety. When actually, I imagine if we ask black people and brown people, people all over the country, well, would you have to have more police or universal daycare? Would you have to have more police or education that's properly funded and culturally important? When you start asking more nuanced questions, the answers shift in our communities. And I think that we should ask more nuanced questions. Derricka, you are a rape survivor. And people often bring up this type of violence when discussing the need for police and public safety. If you could talk about your argument that police are not the way to repair this harm and get justice in the aftermath of a sexual assault and sexual violence. Yes, of course. So um, not only are they not the solution, police contribute to sexual violence. After police brutality, sexual misconduct is the second most reported complaint against cops. And then the people that they arrest, regardless of what, what the reason of arrest, they put them in jails and in prisons, and they make them vulnerable to sexual violence by people who work in jails and prisons. And so police perpetuate sexual violence. They're a site of sexual violence. And then in the few cases where they actually do go and may arrest someone, you have usually women who are fighting to get their rape tests, their rape kits tested, and thousands, 20, 30 thousands of rape kits are just sitting untested all across the United States. Now, what's so unfortunate is that police, um, in addition to not them, I'm sorry, in addition to them not being the solution, it's so frustrating because the people who are most vulnerable to sexual violence are vulnerable to people who they live and share their homes with. They're vulnerable to sexual violence for their neighbors, the, um, um, the people who they employ by, people who work in faith institutions. And so police are a part, they're a manifestation of the culture that's sexually violent. And if we want to reduce our reliance on policing, we also have to reduce the amount of rape culture that's so prevalent in the United States. And could could you comment on what's been happening in uh, in Congress and in terms of legislation around a uh, uh, police abuse and uh, uh, police reform? Uh, clearly, there was a lot of expectation uh, last year and uh, until the beginning of this year that there would be substantive change, but so much of it has uh, fi uh, fizzled out in terms of the refusal of of Congress to be able to reach some kind of a, a real new legislation? What do you think needs well, to be done by those who are advocating abolition or, or systemic reform? Well, the first thing that I would want to say is just my deepest sympathies to the family of George Floyd, who was given so many promises by Joe Biden, by other congressional leaders, that they would achieve police reform in the name of the person that they love. And it's honestly heartbreaking to see, to watch politicians use families of victims of police violence to champion legislation that wouldn't have even saved the lives of the person that they lost. So I first just am, I'm always just so sad that families are used in this way to push an ineffective political agenda, right? So the George Floyd Act was touted by President Biden and other congressional leaders as an attempt to, you know, eradicate bias and police and policing. But the issue is that George Floyd was initially stopped by Derek Chauvin over an alleged use of a counterfeit $20 bill. Congress had the opportunity to give people more resources during an unprecedented pandemic where unemployment rates were through the roof. We were facing a massive eviction crisis. Food insecurity was at, was at its peak, right? So instead of giving people resources, giving us more stipends, making sure that we were protected if we lost our jobs, lost our homes, lost our health care, instead they chose to invest in police. And when someone called the cops on George Floyd, he was met with a level of brutality that police 
regularly and routinely employ and poor black communities. And the idea that you could just use a past one act to train police to better encounter people who may be breaking the law to survive is just woefully insufficient. So abolition are interested in reducing the reasons why people need police in addition to reducing the carceral state, which means at the national level, fighting for a sweeping legislation that makes sure that people have not just food security or housing security, but quality investments in those institutions as well, as why we fight for student debt cancellation, as why we fight for universal health care, as why we fight for universal child care and daycare, so that people who are in vulnerable situations, they can go to work, they can go to school, they can choose to um, have work that gives them dignity and excitement, right? Like, that's the kind of world that we're fighting for, and I believe that as well within our I want to go to chapter eight of your book. It's about the climate. It's titled We Only Want the Earth. On the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina in August, uh, Hurricane Ida left thousands without power, many stranded in Louisiana and its aftermath. I want to turn to a clip of the New Orleans police chief, Sean Ferguson, at a news conference for emergency preparations. We are prepared to assist with every recovery efforts we will have to uh, assist with after this, but also anti-looting. We will not permit, we will not allow any looting throughout this process, and, and, and we will be out there to enforce that. So as I'm asking and begging and pleading with you, please hunker down now, as we will have to hunker down at some point in time ourselves. So that's the New Orleans police chief. If you can respond to what he said, talk about the issue of the climate and how it relates to abolition, and also what we've seen along the border, you know, the whipping of Haitians in Del Rio, Texas. Of course. Well, as our climate continues to heat because of global capitalism, one thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be a continuum of mass displacement of black, brown, people from all over the world. And once that displacement happens, the police are going to be the number one response to punish them, to whip them even, to incarcerate them. And so abolition and, and climate change are indispensable conversations that we have to have alongside each other. I learned from critical resistance that in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, when the city was just absolutely devastated by a hurricane, the very first thing that was built was a jail. And it was a jail that was used to arrest people. When we think about the jails that are in Puerto Rico, where are they positioned, right? They're positioned at the periphery of that island. So when there are hurricanes that happen, they're immediately flooded. You have people who are incarcerated who suffer a, a massive flooding, you know, uh, um, are vulnerable to drowning, disease, vermin. If you look at any of the um, historical shifts and patterns of people who are migrating and immigrating to the U.S. who are fleeing, fleeing, fleeing rather, climate catastrophe, they are met with border patrol and ICE. And so the police are going to be the default response to mitigate the impacts of, of climate change and environmental racism. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, the aftermath of the Michael Brown killing uh, back in 2014, uh, arguably the, a key flashpoint in the development of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, uh, seven years later, uh, do, what do you make of whatever reforms or changes occurred in Ferguson and with the Ferguson Police Department? Well, there's an organization right now who's still fighting to put pressure on the Ferguson Police Department to implement many of the very weak reforms that came as a result of the consent decree that was put into place under the Obama administration. So seven years, you have people in Ferguson who are still fighting to eliminate, you know, cases of people who have outstanding warrants from nearly a decade ago. You have a few um, black elected officials in Ferguson now, which I think could be a, a step forward because many of them are trying to figure out how to reduce the level of violence. But police are still there to serve the purpose of policing. They're still enforcing the evictions. They're still ticketing people who live in that community. They're doing it maybe more nicely, maybe more brown people are doing it, but essentially the day-to-day -day functions of the Ferguson Police Department is it, it's, it's the same. 
And so it's not that we just have to fight the unconstitutional policing that's taking place or in the country. As we see in Ferguson, much of that policing is completely constitutional. And I just am grateful that long after the cameras have left, that there are people in that neighborhood, people in those neighborhoods who are fighting to continue to limit the power that the Ferguson Police Department has. We're all speaking here in New York. Uh, it's clear the next uh, mayor will be uh, Eric Adams, a former police officer, who really has rejected the idea of prison police abolition. Very simply, in the last seconds we have, your response, Derricka. Oh, of course he does. Black political officials, black people running for office, they get to do this. They get to say, I'm black and I'm a part of law enforcement. I understand both sides. And unfortunately, they just create more legitimacy for the police to do very bad things to harmful people. So I would just ask people to not be fooled by black people who say they understand both sides, because there is no both sides. There is a system of oppression where people have the power to kill, to incarcerate, to arrest. And there are people who are vulnerable to it. The people have to resist that.